Now this reactor was was completely cooled by sodium potassium alloy. Now EBR2 is straight sodium, but EBR1 was sodium potassium, and we call it NAC, N-A-K. So N-A is sodium, K is potassium. And it's a eutectic mixture. It means that you mix them such that the lowest, and it has the lowest freezing point. And if you plot the melting point of sodium and the melting point of potassium, and you start mixing them together, the melting point, depending on the ratio, and it gets lower and lower so that when you got the eutectic, and that's what it means, it means the lowest melting point, so NAC is liquid at room temperature. In fact, it doesn't freeze until it's below a freezing point of water. So we didn't have to worry much about freezing of sodium like they did over at EBR2, but here's the control bank here for controlling um, the, the, the primary pu the pumps that controlled the reactor itself. Now look, here's a mechanical pump. It was hard to make a pump that would pump sodium alloy because you can't find bearings that will, that will, will survive when you've got liquid metal running against it. So they, made, they invented, they didn't know whether it worked or not, electromagnetic pump. So there was two pumps, a mechanical pump and an electromagnetic pump. And the secondary pump was also mechanical. So here was the controls for that. And you had power valves, but you also had hand cranks to override them if you had to. Now, uh, a electromagnetic, what was the word you used for the pump? Okay. Electromechanical. Okay. Yeah. You, you know, if I forgot what it was. Electromagnetic, and do you understand what I'm, why I'm saying that? Yes. Okay, you put current through one direction, and magnetic force the other direction, it gives a thrust to the contents of what's in the pipe. So it's a pump without any parts. A pump without any parts, yeah. And it worked very well. How it used on this one was DC. It used a tremendous amount of, power, of electrical power, and it's hard to get enough rectifiers to, to drive it, but they did it. When they got over to EBR2, they had, by then they had developed um, uh, alternating current electromagnetic pumps, and very different than this one that was used here. So why was it so much harder for the mechanical pump? Was it just too thick, or was it, why was that so difficult? The coolant is so caustic, and the, the coolant that comes right up against the seals of the pump. And you don't like sodium leaking past the seals, right. and it gets out in the room with you. It's no good. <laughs> okay, so to try to come up with a seal uh, that would work, and a bearing at the same time, it has to be both a bearing and a seal, was tricky, and they worked very hard at it, and they didn't know whether they would really succeed or not. And the same was true of the electromagnetic pump. And so um, this Kirby Whittem, whose name was on here, he was very much involved in developing that electromagnetic pump back in Chicago before they came out here. So they came out here with both of them as a possibility. Okay. And the control room is arranged such that the Here's the primary coolant system indicators and controls along this side here. And then when you convert from the primary coolant system to the secondary system right here, giving the flow rates and, and the levels and the pressures and so forth. Now the reactor did not take pump pressure directly through the reactor. The reactor was fed with coolant by gravity. Up and way up above us was a gravity tank. So those pumps, the, the primary pumps, didn't pump through the reactor. They pumped up to that tank and kept that tank full. And then if and it overfilled, then you had an overflow and they'd go all the way back down to the basement. So you had constant pressure on the reactor itself. And that turned out to be crucial because you remember there was a meltdown and for a while we didn't know quite why. Right. You described that in the book. It was a chemical yeah. coefficient. The yeah. warping, bending yeah. of the rod. Yeah. There was two things causing warping of the rods. and At the time, we didn't know quite why. The reactor, every new reactor, when it's first cranked up, is first verified to have a negative temperature coefficient. If it has a positive temperature coefficient, it's bad, bad, bad. 
You don't want to, you can run it. It can be operated. In fact, I think Chernobyl, I think, had a positive temperature coefficient. But one of the things you want is to make sure that the temperature coefficient is negative. And it was here. But it was, what was left out is the fact that the temperature coefficient is made up of components. And one of them was higher speed than the other. So the overall component was negative, and so we were able to run this wreck for years, and it behaved as if it only had a negative temperature coefficient, and as the power would go up, the, it would, the, the reaction would start to die and be self-regulating. But what we didn't know, that if you did anything with the flow, it tended to separate the two components of the temperature coefficient. And the one which was negative was too slow. The big negative one was left out, and the fast prompt one was took over. And so they observed it pretty early. But the way they took care of it is they just never messed with flow when this reactor was in operation. The flow was left constant, and you just didn't do anything with it. Until the end of the scheduled experiments for the reactor, the reactor is going to be shut down and we were all through it. EBR1 had done its thing. And, but as a last experiment, we'd find out what really was going on. And so they took some high-risk experiments, and that's when they got the meltdown. And this is the primary controls right here. They, we used a, a galvanometer to indicate reactor power. It had an um, ion chamber, which drove the, a little beam of light, which came across here. And one was the power level, and one was the change in the power level. And uh, these are the external safety rods. When you crank the reactor up, you would, uh, um, of course, the, these rods would be put in. The safety block would be put in position. You know what that is? The, the outer blanket of this reactor is not part of the sodium cooling system. It is air-cooled. It's, we call it the cup. It has air cooling for it, and that big stack up on top was part of that system where you blow air through the outer blanket, which was lo located on a hydraulic ramp lift, kind of like a service station lift, and lifted up. So if you were going to go, when you're going to start up the reactor, the first thing you'd do is lift that thing all the way up until it was stopped by some jacks. And let's see, the jack operation. Handle's broken, can't do it anymore, huh? Anyway, they would be stop it well before it was going to be anything happen. The safety rods would be in would be inserted, would be all, already put in place. Now, uh, safety rods are like control rods, but on this reactor, a control rod is just more fuel. There is no poison that will stop a fast neutron. So you had uh, the the control rods and the safety rods looked quite a bit alike. They were, in fact, nearly identical. It's just the drive that's different. On this, they're either in or out. They're, not, you've, they're either in or you fire them out. They're under on spring control. But the uh, four control rods, which are controlled by this rod selector here, you'd select the control rod you wanted to operate, and then you'd tell it to inject it or whatever, and when you'd finally get it up to where you're beginning to go critical, then these instruments over here would tell you, plus that galvanometer over there. And this was the first level of indication. It was a, called a, a, a vibrating reed galvanometer. It's a DC amplifier. In those days, we didn't have any good DC amplifiers. This was one of the first. And it would tell us when we were about to go critical before you could see any evidence over here. And then when the power level would come up, uh, you could see it there, and we'd start adjusting to get it to what power level we wanted. And this is the safety system here. This is three levels here. If the level goes too high, three levels, the redundancy, any one of the three could shut the reactor down. And then the period meter. The period meter says not only do we don't want it to be too high, we don't want it to be changing too fast. So if it was ever going too fast, it would actually shut the reactor down also. Um, 
because of the change in power was going on too fast. Now when you get up to power, of course, then it'd take an hour, a couple of hours for the heating system to get the steam system going. So if we came here in the morning and cranked up the reactor, it would be nearly noon before we get the generator going. And then it would move our attention over here, and here's where the, the controls are for that. You'd crank up the generator from out there, but here you, you got an indication of um, the, in, the, in, uh, the turbo generator is this one. Now this is, this engine generator, that's an emergency one downstairs. This one was the incoming line. And here we can see what our generator is doing. And here you can see what the incoming line is doing. And you got to merge those two together. And this is a synchroscope that uh, uh, tells you when you got them right. And when you got them right, then you would close the, this line here. And, but you could also run this plant with that emergency generator, and you did that with this. But you didn't do that when you had any of these. These had to be out of commission before you'd have this. You could not synchronize the uh, emergency generator with the incoming line. And so one picture of Mike Novick, I think they show it on television. He's standing right here, and he's getting ready. He's watching this. He's getting ready to close on it when this thing is up and stopped rotating. Okay. Now, if you needed to shut down in a hurry, the commonest thing to do was to pull rods down. down. That's slow. It's not an emergency. And if that wasn't sufficient, you had a reactor off button. And that's... <laughs> this is a reactor off button that says stop on it. I think it had a tag on it one time, reactor off. Now, what it did is it fired these... Uh, safety rods out and drop this safety block which was the bottom of the cup but it was not as a complete you were still had the the outer blanket still up in place now when the accident occurred the reactor was showing signs of taking off and going up to higher and higher power but the reactor operator who had been told anticipated that they were going to do that is they were going to do a series of uh, sneaking up on the reactor power, uh, but not not to hit the. It, it's, you heard a scram button. Yeah. That's it. That drops everything. That drops the outer blanket and everything. You know, you got to take an hour or so to recover from that. So he was instructed to simply back off. He didn't realize that the situation was more severe, and while he was backing it off. Lichtenberger was standing right behind him. They had a desk right here, and they were watching. They had some additional instrumentation on it. He reached over his shoulder, and he hit the off button. Now, that should have been enough. And if, the, if you see the original traces of what happened during the accident, the reactor power is going up. It goes, um, it makes a little dip. That dip is corresponding to when he hit the reactor off button. But it took off again. The postage coefficient, temperature coefficient was in command. And well, there's a lot of publications that said that uh, all, of the bi all of the controls, and all the safeties have been bypassed. That's not true. That's what shut it down. It was appeared to me that it shut it down. And I think the power trips, all of them tripped. But it was just too late. So it went to full, full shutdown. But it was too late to save the reactor. Now, at that time, I wasn't in the control room. I was down in the office down here. <clears throat> and I knew the experiment was going on. And um, they wondered, because they could see it had gone off scale. See, the, uh, here's the charts that were showing the, the famous recordings that's been published. came off of one of these three, maybe all three of them. And it had gone off scale, but it was only off scale for a few seconds. What had, we, had we damaged the reactor? Wouldn't, didn't quite know for sure. Wasn't sure whether the reactor had actually been damaged, but we knew that the reactor power had gone off scale more than ready. And the, by the way, there was no coolant at the time. There was no coolant. This was being used as a critical assembly at the time. There no flow. He's just going to go, we're just going to go up for a few watts. 
then turn around and come back down again. Okay, well, did we damage the reactor, didn't we? They sat here and looking at each other, wondering, wondering. When an alarm went off back here, there's a, a radiation alarm for the gas coolant system back here. And when one of those alarms went off, means that there's some contamination in the blanket gas. Ordinarily, there would be no contamination in the blanket gas. That means there is damage to the reactor. Fuel element failure. There has been fuel element failure. Now we don't know how much. <clears throat> okay, we wondered how much, how much. The level built up, and argon has a half-life of a couple of hours. It's not a very long half-life, but we could. But it's not the argon that's radioactive. It's the contaminant that's in it that's setting off the alarms. And so, little by little, the background starts being higher and higher and higher, and finally, you can actually see it's coming out of here in the room. And it's that point that they decided to take further drastic action. Still don't know how extreme it is. They ended up putting masking tape around the doors, and we all vacated to the office in front. What, what was the primary nuclide that was leaking into the air at that time? <clears throat> well, on a, a reactor that's of this kind, the, there's one thing that's good for it. You see, on a water reactor, you have all kinds of stuff comes off in the water. In a, a sodium cooled reactor, the metallic fission products don't go anywhere. They stay in the system. There's some gaseous fission products that come off, and I can't remember what all they might be. But there's also a one that's a non-metallic, a cesium one that you've heard about. Cesium oh, yeah, we had a lot of experience with cesium. Yeah. And the Japanese are having, they're still fighting cesium. But um, cesium is the one that migrates with the coolant system. But in the uh, stuff that's coming off in the argon, I don't know for sure what all nucleides they might be, but they are the gaseous fission products that comes off of irradiated fuel that's coming off. And the metallic stays in. And even the cesium is just, it, it goes along with the coolant wine. Cesium is chemically very much like sodium. So, okay, now let's see. We vacated to the office space, and there was a lot of talk, and we wanted, well, let's see, after a few hours, we had one guy who they wanted to come in and make a survey to see if he could actually estimate the amount of radioactivity, and what might could be backtracked to tell us how much damage to the reactor. He came in here fully dressed in a Scott Air Pack, but his conclusions were just didn't tell us much of anything. We couldn't draw any conclusions from it. Well, Zinn was not here for the event. Lichtenberger was in charge. And Lichtenberger had to call Zinn to tell him what had happened. And um, we, of course, we'd like to look further into it and find out as soon as possible. We'd like to just open the top of the building and let the gaseous fission products go away. Then we'd come in here and check it out. Well, we were told not to do that. Uh, you know about xenon? Yes. Now, this is not the poison. This is, um, this is the gaseous one that comes off of the atomic bomb. Yeah. And it's the one where we were able to monitor the Russians to see when they were... When they set off an atomic bomb, it throws the one fission product that will cross the country. Well, see, iodine is one of them, but it, doesn't have, it has too short a half-life to do much with, but the cesium is long enough that it'll go clear around the world and come back a second time. Anyway, at the time, our competition with the Russians was very intense, and while we wanted to off-gas our Z, our Z, and it was down at this point, mostly uh, xenon, we were told emphatically we were not to open the reactor, not to look in, because if we were to turn loose some xenon, it would confuse the, our monitors who were while monitoring the Russians here in the United States. Didn't have to go to Russian monitor. We'd monitor especially on the West Coast. But we might confuse it. it what it leaves out of the fact is that our xenon is small compared to theirs. 
we had a reactor that had very low burn up on it. So the xenon is not that significant. But when they set off an atomic bomb, there's lots of xenon. So I don't think it was a valid thing to talk about in the first place. But nevertheless, we were not permitted to do anything with the reactor. Furthermore, we were not to make any statements to the press because it would tell we knew for sure. This is when Louis Strauss, who was head of the Atomic Energy Commission and an arch enemy of General Groves and, and Oppenheimer. <laughs> well, you read the books, you find out more about it. But uh, he, he was a vindictive guy, but he was head of the AEC at the time. He was giving a speech in London, of all places, and he mentioned the meltdown of EBR-1. Our telephones began ringing like we just instantly, all oh, everyone wanted to know what happened. And we were instructions to be silent. And that does not satisfy a newsman. And here's what I learned about it. If you don't tell them, they'll make up their own story. And what they made up was pretty wild. Had not much to do with reality. But we were, the incident occurred in November. We were not allowed to actually open the reactor until March. So we had to sit here and twiddle our thumbs for all those months before we get in to find out what really, we still hopeful that maybe it was just only a few of the, uh, elma, sub, uh, the fuel elements had melted. Not all of them, as it turned out, most of them had. The outer row had not. We were able to actually pull off some of the outer um, fuel, uh, fuel rods separate from the main, main part. Okay, so that kind of tells you how that happened, huh? Okay, let's see, what else? You don't like this? Uh, well, we were thought the reactor was done anyway, it hardly matters. We're, going, we're already being trained on EBR2. It was while under construction. We little do we know it was still going to be quite a while before EBR2 really went critical. But anyway, uh, we thought, well, we were through here anyway. It was the last scheduled experiment. The AEC was notified that it was a high-risk experiment. They denied it later, said they didn't know nothing about it. We did it on our own. <laughs> well, that's Monday morning quarterbacking. Um, you might look at this, um, um, the alarm panel. Here's three rows of red lights. Any one of these lights that come on, the reactor would already be down. It would be, do, go down on itself automatically for any one of those reasons. Here's one row of amber lights. These gave you two minutes. If you could correct the problem in two minutes, you could stay up. The rest are blue, are merely warnings. And I did a lot of the wiring behind that panel. Uh, this is, by the way, is the controls for the air dissipator over there on the other side. They said turn those four fans on. So you could run the reactor down almost room temperature and be at power if you ran that system. How often uh, would you have to use like the scram button to shut the reactor down? We ordinarily didn't scram it very often, but... I know there's that pull loose. Okay. If the scram button didn't work, you could yank this and that cable goes all the way downstairs and releases the hydraulic pressure underneath the outer blanket and it falls go lump. Can you reach that high? No, it came down lower in those days. It was down about right here. And we timed it. It, would, it took about a second for the reactor up to fall. That's slow compared to where you want a control rod to drop much, much faster than that. Are you got a nuclear background? No. You, no? <laughs> I, just, I just know about this building in particular. Oh, okay. Being out here, 